can you get a decent representation of a brand's high-end pens when using its lower-end pens? For example, comparing a Platinum Procyon with a 3776. Obviously, they have different nib materials, but do you think things like nib widths match up? Uh, this is a really good question. I'm surprised I don't get asked this a lot more. Um, so yes, thinking through this a little bit, I'm glad you asked it. I'm happy to talk through some of my thoughts. The short answer of it is that it varies. Uh, it, it matters more with some brands than others. Um, so I tried to go through and I'm going to talk today about some of the ones that I feel maybe, maybe do represent a little bit better, some of the ones that maybe don't, um, you know, and, and I can at least prompt the thought further for you. So using the Procyon and the 3776 as an example, um, you know, you're talking about pretty much in all these examples, but you know, you specifically mentioned these two pens, uh, Procyon steel nib, 3776 gold nib, right there, the nib is going to make a bit of a difference. I looked at my writing samples that I've done for both pens. Um, and I think if you're really getting nitty gritty and comparing how does the medium width of the Procyon compared to the medium width of the 3776 or the fine or whatever, there's going to be a little bit of variance between the two. So I think if you're thinking like, I want exactly the same line width writing experience, mm, that's not necessarily the case. I think what you see on these two pens is pretty common with what you see with most other pens in that probably the, the nib width itself is pretty similar, but the fact that the nib uh, on a gold nib, the nib material is going to be a little bit inherently softer than stainless steel. You're going to get a little more generous flow, especially if you have a slightly heavier hand. I have a slightly heavier hand. Um, so you're going to see some of that uh, slightly broader line width, uh, all else being equal with a gold nib than you might with a steel nib, just because that, that the tines are going to tend to want to open up just, just a little bit more to make it right, just a little bit wetter. Um, that I find is pretty common, pretty universal among most fountain pens, um, is that uh, most gold nibs tend to write just a, a hair wetter than stainless steel. That's not a universal rule, but it's common enough where I think I can fairly safely make that approach. Uh, and, you know, specifically the Procyon 3776, um, that does kind of be the case. Um, now, the writing experience overall between these two pens, the 3776, even though it's a gold nib, um, is still a relatively stiff gold nib. So the, the writing experience is not going to be as drastic with that as it would say, you know, using Visconti as an example, Visconti's stainless steel nibs they would have on say their uh, Breeze or Mirage, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, those are gonna be significantly stiffer than what you would see on a Homo Sapiens or an Opera Master or something like that. Um, the, the variance between those is much greater, almost uncomparable. Uh, so there might be other things about the pen, you know, fit and finish, general design, things like that that can come into play. I think in terms of nib width, I had one more thought on that to get back to for something like Platinum, right? Like they're a Japanese pen company and this goes for Sailor and, and um, Pilot as well, as well as other, I don't have a lot of experience with other Japanese companies, but I imagine it's similar. They tend to grind their finer nibs a little finer than uh, their Western counterparts. So I think that is something that that is kind of common between um, the the steel and gold nibs of of the same companies, you know, Platinum and, and Pilot especially, I have more experience with those brands. They're both their steel and gold nibs in the extra fine and fine especially, not as much in the mediums and the broads, uh, but a little more in the extra fines and fines. Those are going to be ground a little finer across both high end and low end um, than, you know, say like a Lamy or a Pelican. Uh, as, as, you know, examples of, of Western pens, Visconti, these types of, of brands. Um, so that is, that is something that does kind of translate between, okay, would a lower end pen give you somewhat of an idea of a higher end pen? So if you're looking at getting a, a Pilot Custom 823, that's going to write pr pretty different, you know, in some respects than a Pilot Metropolitan, you know, as an example, or a Vanishing Point. Um, you know, so the difference between a Vanishing Point and a Metropolitan the nibs are, are, the design is completely different. It's gold versus steel. 
the size is completely different, the feed design is different. So yeah, it's going to be definitely a different writing experience, um, but the still the extra fine and fine nibs are going to be finer on those than they might on a Lamy or a Pelican or something like that. So I do think in some respects it can be it can be an indicator in other respects, maybe not as much, especially in like nib feel, smoothness and flow and things like that. That's where it varies the most from low end to high end, pretty much on most brands. Um, but the width can can be a closer indicator, sort of, with most brands. Again, not Visconti. Um, you know, other things, let's see here, looking at uh, Lamy, so comparing like a Safari to maybe a Studio or a Lamy 2000. So you get a good sense of like the fit and finish of a pen. You know, uh, it's got that kind of German precision uh, and you'll get a sense of, you know, what the, what the materials are like and so on, which some of them may be similar. Um, the nibs themselves, are gonna be a little bit different for something like a 2000. Um, but, you know, if you go with something like going from a Safari to maybe a Studio or a, or a Lux uh, or a Scala, they're gonna be basically similar nibs to what is on a Safari. So in that respect, it really would be a similar writing experience. Um, it's just the pen body that would be largely different. With the caveat that some of their pens, some of the higher end Scala CP1 Studios might have a 14 karat gold nib, that you would also see on things like the Emporium uh, that are going to be uh, a different writing experience, the Lamy Dialog 3. Um, those are going to be similar in look to the steel Lamy nibs, uh, but they're gonna write different. They're much smoother, bouncier, much wetter. Um, so, so that's where one caveat will be there. But even still, it's, it's, it's not, a, not a terrible um, uh, comparison uh, between those. So, I mean, generally speaking, if you like the way that a steel nib Lamy writes, you're definitely going to like the way that a gold nib writes because it's just, it's going to be more enjoyable, I think. Um, you know, other aspects of the pen, like between a Safari and a Lamy 2000, they're largely just very, very different pens. Um, so not as much to compare between those two. Um, kind of similar between like a Pilot Varsity and Metropolitan, maybe comparing that to like a Vanishing Point or a Custom 823. It's gonna be a lot of different things on those pens. You get a general sense of maybe just the, the build quality and, and some of the design aspects maybe across some of those models, but they're gonna vary quite a bit. So your mileage may vary there. Um, looking at Pelican. So Pelican, um, they sell some lower end pens that are like in their like kid pens, you know, which is like the Pelicano, Pelicano Junior, the twist, some of those types of things, those are not at all indicators of some of their higher end stuff. Um, looking at, you know, some of the lower end of, let's say, the Suvron series, like the M200, and comparing that to an M800 or 1000, you know, the writing experience is going to be a little different because you're going to, you know, these are the steel nibs on the 200, the gold nibs on the 800 and 1000, a little softer writing experience and these types of things. But overall, it's still a piston fill mechanism. You still get you still get the interchangeable nib units, um, and overall style is similar. So these, I would say, it's a pretty decent, you know, for what for what it is. I mean, obviously, it's going to be different the higher end you go, um, but I think it's a pretty decent representation. So if you like an M200, you're almost certainly going to like things higher in the series. So if you wanted to ease into Pelican, starting with M200 is not a terrible idea. Um, what else we got here? Even on some of the higher end stuff, like looking at Namiki as an example, um, looking relatively to the price, some of their emperors might be, you know, eight, ten, fifteen thousand uh, dollars. You know, but if you go with, you know, a Yukari or a Nippon Art or something like that, that is, you know, under a thousand or around a thousand, um, those are going to give you an introduction to Yurushi Lacquer, Makie, those gold nibs. You know, I think that is a pretty good representation if you're starting to get into some higher end stuff like Namiki with some of that Japanese artwork. Um, that can be a pretty good stepping stone, you know, as you get up into the Yukari Royales. You know, even if you get into like some of the, the pilot custom Yurushi and stuff like that, I think um, you're going to get a good sense on some of the lower end stuff. And then the, the higher end stuff, the pens are bigger and just more elaborate. The artwork is, is even more impressive. Um, uh, but I think that, that there's some crossover there. Um, looking at some of the other, um, you know, pens like Visconti, Aurora, Montegrappa, they have some really high-end stuff. Their low-end stuff is really pretty different 
from their high-end stuff. I think most of the Italian brands are probably that way. The low-end stuff is really quite a different range of product. Um, Diplomat, I was looking at them, you know, their low end, like they have the Magnum, which is around $20, you know, does that really compare to an Arrow or an Excellence? It really doesn't, it's a completely different pen. So I, I don't know that I could say that with Diplomat that it would be the case. So it, it's really gonna vary quite a bit. It's actually not super, super common for a brand to have a $20 or 10 or $20 pen and then a $500 or $1,000 pen. It's actually relatively few companies that have such a broad range. I think most pen companies tend to kind of focus in one particular area. Uh, and then every now and then they might come out with something special that's like kind of crosses those, those barriers, but there really is kind of a, a focus that most companies tend to have. The really larger ones may have a broader swath of, of product range, but I think a lot of companies tend to more or less stick to their wheelhouse. I'm thinking like Monte Grappa, for example, really focuses on high end. You know, the Elmo that they have is really the lowest they've ever, lowest price they've ever had. They, you know, have a, a few different colors, but it's not like this wide range of lower end stuff. And it's even still, it's a couple hundred dollars. It's not, not super, you know, I wouldn't even think that most people would consider that entry level. Um, it's entry level for Monte Grappa. Um, you know, in the same respect, Lamy, they have mostly, you know, it's kind of intro level stuff and they don't have a lot of, a lot of high end. They have a couple they've come out with, the Lamy 2000, you know, kind of would fit in that range, Dialogue 3, Emporium, you know, and that's kind of it. And not a whole ton of that. It's not a huge focus uh, for their brand. They are definitely more like, you know, the pens for the people. So I think each company tends to have their own area of focus um, and the needs are very different across those those uh, price ranges, so um, that the pens do tend to range uh, quite a bit. So I think that uh, I, as much as I would probably love to say that uh, getting a lower end pen within a given brand is a good way to get a sense of that brand and you know, you know that you can kind of grow within that brand if you become a collector and you really get into it and you want to grow up, but um, I think it's so kind of pick and choose and it's, it's inconsistent enough where I can say it's not a universally applicable statement to say, yes, if you get an entry level pen, you're getting a good sense of that brand as a whole. And I think, you know, part of it, if you've been into fountain pens for a little while, you may even know like certain brands, like, man, they really nail it with this, this, and this model, whatever the price range. But this other one, this one, this other one, yeah, this is really, they're kind of flops. They didn't really nail it with that one. That's really like every pen brand you can pretty much pick and choose. And it might be your own personal opinion that other people could have very different views on anyway. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just not consistent enough to say like, yeah, for sure. Uh, because there's just so much to it. Every pen that comes out basically has to be designed from scratch. Um, and so uh, you're going to get pretty much no matter each pen, no matter the price range, is going to be need, need to be evaluated more or less on its own accord. And that's kind of how I feel about it. But you can disagree.